Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Debbie and I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Hi. And it's really nice to finally be here. Um, I want to thank David for inviting me, and I want to thank Anne for the emergency snack sack, um, and Mary Mason for being my friend and flying with me today. I'll tell you, she takes such good care of me that she was ready to fly any plane to get me up here all by herself, just so we could be here today. And um, it's really great to be here. Happy birthday, everybody. And uh, I want to welcome the people who are in their first 30 days of sobriety. That's a long time. That's a long time. Um, just to give you a snapshot of what the last week and a half has been for me, about a week and a half ago, uh, because I'm on the 12-step call list, um, for, and I get a lot of the daytime calls, because I don't work at this time, and so I get a lot of the daytime calls for 12-step calls. And uh, I got a call, and uh, another gal I sponsor and I, who's under a year sober, we later went out that day, we made the call, we took her to a meeting, got... You know, it's, it's always great when, when you're around the used booze smell coming through their pores, you know? I mean, I mean that was my fragrance for a long time, and... Um, it's a, it's a, just a great reminder that I don't subscribe to that brand anymore. So take her to a meeting, and, and then I had to leave town for four days. I come back in town, find out that she's got, you know, a few days sober now. And, I mean, she drank after. We, we didn't cure her, but she drank after the meeting that night, you know. I mean, that had been too much for her, really, you know, an AA meeting. <laughs> and... Um, so on, uh, on Tuesday of this week, I got a, another 12-step call. And th- this, this one, I got to tell you, I kind of internally grumbled about because I got stuff to do, okay? And, uh, but I agreed to make the call, and, and uh, you know, we're, we just never really ever call when it's convenient, you know, uh, for other people. And so I, I call her back and we, I, I, uh, I said, I, I can't come right now, but I will, I'll be there in a few hours. And I got to thinking, who can I find during the day to go with me? And it dawned on me about the woman I'd made the call on the prior week. I called her up and I was chatting with her and said, uh, what, do you, what are you doing this afternoon? Because I need your help. Well, really, what do, you, what, what do you want me to do? I said, well... Because she's got four days of sobriety, see? I need your help to go on a 12-step call with me. Okay, what time you want me to be there? And here she is, four days sober, going on her first 12-step call. Because you see, that new woman can relate to this four days a lot more than she'll be able to relate to me. I'm basically just the driver, you know, at that point. <laughs> And I'm not as important as this woman who's four days sober at this moment. And uh, we get over there, and of course, this is she, her last drink was that morning sometime, and she's still residually drunk. And and um, what happened is we've got this little thing going in our area now where we I've just have dubbed it the 12-step squad of women. And uh, one gal starts getting on the phone and putting a little schedule together, and for three days we didn't leave this woman alone. She's staying at our homes, and and we've got her in the day and during at meetings, and we we did a handoff. I mean, she's just like, I mean, they just keep handing me off to people. You know, I haven't been home in three days. And because um, we knew until we got her through those first three days or so, it's she will probably drink again. But here is what, when I say 30 days is a long time, this is what clicked into my mind. Wednesday night, I had brought her to a regular meeting I go to, and I learned that there is an, another woman in the meeting who'd had a drink or gotten drunk that morning, was in, kind of wandered over into our meeting, 
And so I, I go and start uh, chatting with her, and all of a sudden I said, Cindy, come over here. I said, Cindy, this is Vicki. Tell her how long you've been sober. She says, well, at 6 o'clock it'll be 30 hours since my last drink. And she says, really? And right there, I stood and I watched these two, her listening in this 30 hours. Yeah, well, I'm still shaking, and I'm, but I'm feeling a little better. And, you know, these people just haven't left me alone. And, um, and I'm watching these two people talk, and I'm standing there observing this, and it's like circa 1935. I mean, this is... This was this magic that we do. And I'm thinking to myself, and, I, and then the bell rings, and it's time to sit down, and I'm thinking in there, I could have missed this by being selfish and self-centered and self-serving and said, you know what, I'm just too busy. I got stuff to do. Stuff or help somebody live. Not really a difficult decision. But I also am reminded when I have, when I say my prayers in the morning, show me how you want me to be of service. I don't get to pick and choose. Clearly, that was going to be what my day was designed for. The other weird thing about that is I was meeting with uh, some women the week before on the first 12 step call, both but two out of the three, we were in the chapter working with others. And during the second one, and believe this is a true story, during the second one is when I got the first 12 step home. And it's like God's hand some days is so imprinted on that day, you cannot deny the power if you let him run your life, what you're supposed to be doing out there. So, I knew we'd get here today. I wasn't worried about it at all. And if for some reason I wasn't supposed to be sharing my story with you tonight, there's a room full of speakers. Everybody in this room has a story. But tonight, you just got to have to listen to mine. Okay. <laughs> there are three things that are most important to me, that if I don't have them in my life in an active state, I don't stay sober. And if you are new here, I hope that, you know, this is, this is what you can hear. Because without these three things, I was not able to stay sober with them. I am. So the, the formula is a workable formula for me. And that is a sobriety date, a home group, and a sponsor. We have our triangle of recovery, unity, and service, and that's what my topic is tomorrow, is the three legacies. And this is a personal triangle for me of those three things. And my sobriety date is February the 8th, 1976, which means I just celebrated my 30th birthday. So again, that number 30 creeps up into my life a lot. Um, I never thought I would see 30 years of age and let alone being able to celebrate 30 years of this awesome way of life. Uh, it's not my first sobriety date, but it's my current one. <laughs> and it'll, it will stay my current one as long as anything else that affects me from the neck up. Uh, my physical sobriety to me is what that basis is. That's got to be in place 24-7 because nothing else can really happen or stick in my life if I am not physically sober, if I am altered in any fashion, I lose the connection. But I also know for myself that's not the end. It's the launching pad. That physical sobriety for me is very black and white. That means for me, I don't drink near beer, okay? I, didn't, I don't smoke near pot, okay? <laughs> um, I don't take health store speed. Okay, I just don't take any of the, I never got near drunk, okay? I was always for the full out boogie on it. I was never a part-time social drinker. 
I have no desire to sip. Um, when I think about drinking, it's never the lovely glass of wine or whatever. It is always the glug, 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 glug. So I don't even think in social drinking terms. I don't even have that. Where, that's not where I go. And so I know that it's, it's, it's very black and white for myself because I know my mind. You get one justification going, the second one is easier. The more rationale, and, and it, it's gone, it's off. And so I, I really need to keep it very clean and very clear for myself. But I also know that it is, as I said, the launching pad, because I had the impression that if you quit drinking and quit taking those drugs, that your life would get wonderful. I continue to do the daily maintenance. And what is that daily maintenance? Just some of those things for me are, I book in my day the same, which is I start on my knees talking to a God I've developed a relationship with, and I end my day on my knees talking to that God. We chat a lot in between, but those are the, the bookends of my day. Um, I answer my phone without screening my calls. I'd love to screen my calls, let me tell you. Uh, when I see it's her again and it's going to be the same drama, oh yeah, you know, I'd like to, you know, I'm in the shower type thing. And uh, But you know, once again, I would have missed so many opportunities of service because most of my opportunities come through the phone. And that's my job. That's how I look at that kind of function. Um, I don't take that first drink or anything. Uh, I had non-alcoholics ask me questions like, why do you always have to get drunk? Why can't you have a couple like we do? And I really, honest to God, before any information about alcoholism was in my life, I honest to God did not know. I just knew I liked to get drunk. And so, but when I just stopped the drinking and changed nothing else, I drank again. And when I just did the not drinking and going to some meetings, I got loaded again. And until I incorporated this as a way of life or had the willingness to do that, I could not stay sober because nothing inside was changing. So that is just some bare minimum stuff of what I do on some of the daily maintenance. But it's, it's where it all begins for the rest of my life to function and happen. So if you are new here tonight and you don't have a sobriety date, I really encourage you to get one. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous makes a lot more sense when you're sober. You know, just a, su just a suggestion, you know. Um, a home group. I've lived in four different parts of the country, and very different parts. That, for me, then has been, I have had four different home groups to this moment. That's the only reason I've ever changed home groups, is because I've literally left the state or something. And when I made this last move, I realized I've also had four different last names, okay? So, <laughs> just kind of worked out that way. Um, and so I got sober in Minneapolis. Uh, that's not where I started out in my life, but that's where I got sober. I, my original last name was Fegan, and I uh, was a member of the 12 by 12 group uh, there. I lived there almost four years. In, or was sober almost four years, lived there longer, but moved to Atlanta. I lived there almost seven years. Uh, my home group was a Skyland group, and due to a profession I was interested in getting into, I legally changed my name to Richards. And so there I was Richards. And then I, due to marriage, I moved to Long Beach, was a member of the Bellflower Big Book group for almost 14 years. My name there was Harris. And then I moved to Northern California, and my home group is now the primary purpose group, meets on Thursday nights in Dublin, and my name is now Davis. And uh, so, uh, I and I won't even tell you how many hair colors it was, you know, it just, <laughs> suffice it to say more than four. Um, but I believe so strongly in a home group because it's been in that environment, literally, that I have learned how to uh, live in this world. Um, when I, I was so, such a blank 
board. I didn't know how to communicate with people. All I knew how to do was drink. That was it. There was no plans, dreams, uh, I'm going to make my mark in the world, I'm going to have a family, I'm going to travel, I'm going to have a great career. It was from the last party to the next party and the drinking in between. That was my life. And so it was very, it, you know, I, I'm sure that they taught me a lot of the principles that I would learn in Alcoholics Anonymous, but you spoke it in a language I understood. The very first thing you taught me when I got here is about courtesy and consideration of which I knew none of. That mirror stopped right in front of my face, and that was the only person I ever thought about or saw. You taught me about stopping to disturb the people around me from talking or getting up or making fusses. And I didn't think a thing of it. If I was bored, I assumed you were too, you know? <laughs> so let's liven it up. Um, you taught me about how to have a commitment instead of doing all the taking that I knew how to do so well, how to give back by having a commitment and anonymously be of service. I didn't need the big pats on the back or the you know, spotlight recognition, but just to learn how to be of service and anonymously give. And, and every year still, unless I get, I just got elected treasurer for my home group, but I always would go up to the secretary otherwise and say, how can I be of service to you this year? And let them tell me what they need instead of me say, I want this job, I want that job. How can I be of service to you? And that way I... I'm not in charge of my new lessons this year. I've, I've learned here how to place principles before personalities. Um, I have sat in the rooms where it's me, the soon-to-be ex, he, and the brand new she, okay? <laughs> you know, no, I, I went through a divorce here in, in sobriety, and nobody got custody of the home group, okay? So <laughs> you learn... You learn how to do it one event at a time and that you're reminded that you have only one job here in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and that is to carry your message, to welcome the new and frightened faces, to work the room, to be in the meeting. And, and when whatever my personal problems are, they're left in the car. I've also had in every home group, I don't know if you guys do, but there's always a couple of people that I know would be happier in another home group, okay? <laughs> Intuition, I know this. And, you know, it's amazing that I was the one who changed the home groups by moving in different states, and there was always those same couple or two people. But, you know, every time I'm thinking that about somebody else, i got to remember somebody's probably wishing I would be in another home group too, you know. So I... Uh, have learned that it's great to just to just focus on getting and be a part of that particular group and the faces come and go and there's no greater learning ground than the meeting rooms and business meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've learned so much from a home group. It has grounded me. It has given me such a sense of, um, you know, in touch with people because I am an isolator by nature. It is very easy for me to be alone. I'm fine with my own company. I'm really okay alone. And, and I have no conflicts that way with anyone. <laughs> I like it like that. But that's not the real world. And you have shown me how to do so much and to be accepting and tolerant of other people. Um, and a sponsor to me, I've had three sponsors in sobriety. I have one in Minneapolis one in Atlanta, and one in Southern California, who I continue to have. We've been walking this path now for over 19 years. Um, I just absolutely adore this woman. And she has, uh, in summary, she's somebody I want to be like when I grow up. And I don't know of any better way for me to pick a sponsor because that's someone who I will listen to, who I, I will try to emulate the best of my ability who I will take those secrets to because I can't keep secrets. Um, we are as sick as our secrets, and the minute I start keeping one, it's easier to keep another and another and another. And I need someone to be that open book with. I've never been judged or patronized or hung up on or yelled at because I don't treat my sponsor like that. I don't treat sponsees like that. And so I get to pass on 
the gift of living with some dignity and grace in my life, learning how to be a woman in Alcoholics Anonymous and live the kind of life on the inside that I always wondered, you know, how you'd ever get that, let alone would it be available for somebody like me. And so if you are new here or sitting in these seats, restless, irritable, and discontent, and you don't know why, and you don't have all three of these things in your life in an active state, an honest sobriety date, a home group you're in the middle of, and a sponsor that you actively work with, I invite you to incorporate those in your life if you want to be different in your life. If you don't want to feel the way you're feeling, this has been the solution for me. And I invite you to join us on that journey. And my journey to Alcoholics Anonymous began this month, April 13th, uh, next Friday. It was also a Friday, 1970. I took my first drink. I was 12 years old at that time. Uh, that means I'm 48 now, so we get all those numbers out of the way for you. Um, <laughs> don't want you to miss anything. Uh, counting. Um, so I, I had been invited earlier in the week by the cool kids in school, and I very much wanted to be a part of them. And I'd heard them talk about drinking. I never heard anybody talk about drunk. But somewhere in my mind, I got it that I'm going to get drunk Friday night, so that is the most assured way I will be accepted by these kids. And now, when I took my first drink, I've never seen anyone drunk. There isn't any problem drinking in my family. The, the closest thing we've got is a suspect uncle, okay? <laughs> that, that isn't even confirmed, you know? That's only under vague suspicion. So I am the only representative of, our, of alcoholism here uh, for that family. <laughs> And so I never saw a problem drinking. I didn't even know you how do you get drunk. I just had this mind, you probably have to drink a whole bunch, but I'm not really sure, but that's what I'm going to do. And so when I woke up Friday morning, I had my usual good ideals on my list. Be a good daughter, a good student, obey the rules, stay out of trouble. I'm not a rebel. I never have been. I'm a conformist. I want to do the right thing. I don't like negative attention. I don't like trouble. I'm not trying to be perfect, but I just kind of invisible in a way. And then the second thing on my list that morning, that Friday morning, is I'm going to get drunk tonight. Now, I don't know that those two things are going to collide at about 6.30 that night. But we started drinking about 6 o'clock. And it's kind of like a liquid potluck, you know, whatever you stole from the drugstore, your parents, and you just, you know how you do that. And there is a brown bag going around, and there's a bottle in it, and I don't know what's in it, but I know what's in it, alcohol. And, you know, you're just excited. You don't even know what's going to happen, but you're just excited anyway. And, and um, it's coming around, and because... When you're 12 and 13, you don't want to stand out. So, you, okay, that's what they did. So when it got to me, what I saw them do is they took a pull off of that bottle and they handed it to the next guy. And I did that. And, of course, that first drink, you know, that just rips out your throat. You can always get another throat, right? <laughs> this is not a consequence. And it goes down and it hits... It just, it hits that internal bottom. And for me, the analogy is like hot lava. It was warm and thick and quiet, and it just flowed, and it filled in every hole in my gut, and I didn't even know I had any. I took my first drink not because I was running away from a horrible home life, abuse, violence, neglect. Quite the contrary regular old middle class family, kind and loving parents, the only child, Catholic school, Catholic church, no bad nun stories to tell you. I mean, <laughs> just a nice little Midwestern family. And so I'm not running away from any of that. I just want to be accepted by these kids. And when you're 12 and 13, that's a very natural thing to do. But what happened to me when I took a drink of alcohol was not natural. 
what happened to me did not happen to those other kids in the room. What happened to me does never has never happened to my parents. What happened to me was that I got this warm glow two inches behind my belly button. And I'm thinking, you know, when I'm 12 years old, an oatmeal has never done this for me, you know. <laughs> I like what is ever in there, and I want some more right now. And when that bottle came around the second time because I wanted the same effect, I took the same action, and I took a pull off of that bottle, and I gave it to the next guy. It rips out your throat again the second time, does that magic the second time. And if there is some sort of a line that gets crossed, I had just done crossed it. I didn't know I've just had the only social drink I will ever have in my life. <laughs> Who knew I would be telling the people about this in Portland, you know? <laughs> and uh, what happened is that the anxiety I felt up here, please accept me, turned into arrogance down here. <laughs> and after that second drink, I sort of internally threw my shoulders back. I looked at those kids around that room and I thought, hey, aren't they glad I'm here? <laughs> you know, I mean, you talk about an almost instant change of perception and I totally identified that with that second drink. And what happened is I moved into another world that I liked a lot better than anything I had ever experienced before. Because I went into a room in my mind all by myself. I no longer needed your approval. You were no longer important in my life. That quick, that fast, I moved into the disease of alcoholism. And that night I would not know it until I would be in, given information about alcoholism but I would certainly set a lot of patterns. I do not know if I was born an alcoholic. I didn't do a lot of things prior to the first drink that I would do after the first drink. But I know that when I took that drink, I activated this disease. I activated the mental obsession. I told you how I woke up Friday morning, good ideals, get drunk. Saturday morning, they're in reverse already. Get drunk, and those good ideals will eventually be off the list because you can't drink and do them, so they go. Not the drinking. And I woke up the next six years thinking about drinking. How, what, where, when, why, last night, tomorrow night, today. That became automatically just this transition happened that that would be how I would think. I activated the physical craving. When I take a drink... I take a drunk. I don't know. I cannot control my drinking. My attitude was I don't want to. But in a way I knew after a while I can't control it. I am completely obsessed with more. There is never enough. That Friday night was the last time I ever shared a bottle of alcohol with anybody. You get your own. And so I am selfish from the gate on that booze. And I would, a year later, get into the wonderful world of drugs because I needed to. I needed these accessories in my life so I could drink longer. I wasn't into sleeping through life. I was into staying up for days. I was into things like speed and acid. They will help you. Uh, I liked them because they got you there quicker and in color, you know, and it just, it was my deal, and for the next several years, that's what I did on a regular, which became a daily basis the last year and a half. At 17 and a half, I had uh, been that tornado in that family's home. My father had remarried, and I was living with him. They were... You know, my name had gone from being in the paper for being on the honor roll to now for uh, some embarrassing things. Um, the, he was coming to get me out of jails. Uh, this is not exactly the kind of uh, path he had hoped for me. And now the, the final straw for him was I had been expelled from my senior year of high school six weeks before I was supposed to graduate. From the, for the third and final time, uh, all for my drinking problem, age 17. 
And I didn't care. You know, it didn't bother me that that happened. Uh, it bothered him a great deal. And he had tried all human power to relieve me of my alcoholism. And we know that if human power and love could, how many people tried so desperately to help us? We wouldn't need to be here, but no human power can. But he sought professional advice. They suggested that he commit me because he still had legal custody. And when I showed up two weeks later, no one but me knew where I was. Uh, looking for money, uh, once again, he had a surprise for me. And uh, this time the police car took me to a treatment center. I had been committed there. I was 17 and a half years old to a little town in Grand Forks, North Dakota. And I'm um, there for alcoholism and drug addiction. Now, I'm the only one who thinks they've made a mistake. Um, <laughs> my battle cry was, I'm not even of legal age to buy it yet. I mean, there should be a connection, you know, to that. You should at least wait. And... Um, and so, but you know, nobody pays attention to the drunks anymore, but, uh, and so I'm in there and I would be introduced to you for the very first time. I didn't, wasn't looking for you because I wasn't looking for any solution to my non-existent drinking problem. Okay. So I'd never heard about sobriety, uh, the disease of alcoholism, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, I'd never heard about any of those words before. We would be taken to outside meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, and because I didn't want to catch it, uh, alcoholism, I would sit in the farthest possible corner of the room. And I would distract myself until people doing exactly what I'm doing, which is sharing their story, their experience, strength, and hope we're up here doing. I'd distract myself so that, you know, until it was over. It just, you know, we had nothing in common. And, of course, they said, find the similarities. But I don't think so, because if you find the similarities, then you might be one of those people. And I, I, I don't want to join up. I'm not here to, I'm just here to get the heat off. I'm here to become invisible again so that I can just, I'll do everything they ask me to do so I can just kind of vanish out there and get back to doing what I want to do, which is drink all day long. That, to me, did not identify problem drinking. You know, it's just like we just have so no clue. <laughs> and so we, I would um, sit in the back, and every now and then I would tune into what these people were saying. And I would rationalize away what they said, but in my own small way, I began to little tiny bits in my own way identify. They talked about uh, losing their family because of drinking. I thought to myself, <laughs> you can have mine. You can take mine. If you need one, uh, have mine. I don't, I don't need them or want them because they're always yak yakking about my drinking. And down here where I really live, it had been necessary for me to leave their home because they no longer had a safe place to come home to. They never knew what, what they would come home to in me. They talked about um, totaling out cars. And in my mind said... I have never totaled out a car officially, okay? <laughs> you know how specific we get. If it wasn't the same make and model, it doesn't count, right? But I, I had a little drunk car that arrived to Alcoholics Anonymous, the kind that when you buy them, they are, they're square, okay? So they start off square. <laughs> but when you drink and drive like I do, which is every time you drink, you drive, um, Things get, you get rounded out with the drunk bumps and misjudgments and things are falling off and, you know, the window had been shot out of it and um, my gas cap was a mitten I had stuck in there. <laughs> yeah, I'm like driving a Maltoff cocktail around tight, you know, jeez. But you're just so busy out there, and that's drinking money, so you don't have time for this stuff. <laughs> um, so they talked about losing jobs. And I always had some little legitimate job because I needed the money. I didn't know how to support myself in any other way. And, um, and so I, 
I've got these little jobs, but I, I, when the fog began to lift a little more, I began to realize, okay, I, I, I was let go of a couple jobs. And um, I did quit a couple times before they let me go. But that last year especially, I, I'd acquired, I guess I was trying to be responsible or something. I acquired this bad habit of quitting in a blackout. It, it, that, that, that's a problem because you show up the next day, you know, <laughs> trying to be a good employee and, you know, everybody's surprised, including you, and you quit and you don't know, you know, it's just, it's just such <laughs> awkward moments, you know, in my life. I've, they're full of awkward moments. And, and so these are the rationales I had. And then there, but there were two things that really bothered me. And, and I don't know why I heard them, but what one of them that came up like a big old tree was all those broken promises. And I, 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 I remember thinking, how did they know about those? You know them because you did them. And I looked back in my life and realized from the time I took my first drink, I couldn't keep a promise. Because always the promise ended with be good, which meant don't drink or take any drugs, and I could not do that. I would want to, I would mean to, I don't want to let you down again. But the longest I could go was shy of two weeks. When that second Friday rolled around, I'm sorry, everything is off. And I have to drink. I don't know it in those words, but that's just what the actions dictate. And the other thing was a woman talking about trying to scrub away the sound. And that's why all the used booze fragrance I've been around has been so important to me. To remind me, sens sensory, of what I used to be like and what I don't want to be like today. And yet, if I start making excuses for not doing this or not doing that and doing the near beer and doing the near stuff, I'll be the one making the phone call. And I don't want to be that again. And so I heard that, and I thought, you know what, if I'm not careful, I'm, I might be one of those people. And that's as close as I got to thinking there was a possible problem. I was sent to an all-women's halfway house. I didn't like women. That's why they thought that would be a really good idea. And there with 40 of them. The minimum was one AA meeting a month. Okay, I'm not going to go to two. I mean, I mean, I, I'm just passing through. I'm just visiting Seven months later, I went to Northern California to visit my mother. First week I'm out there hanging around the people I used to drink with. Of course, they had encouraged a no-no on that. Not going to stop me. Last week and a half, I'm drunk and loaded with them. No surprise, not even to me. But something had totally shifted in my drinking. They told me that AA would ruin your drinking, that there's nothing more than a head full of A and a belly full of booze, and I proved them right. Everything looked different. I couldn't get where I used to get. I couldn't be what I used to be. I couldn't feel what I used to feel. I couldn't shut down what I used to shut down. Everything was different, and I was mad. I was mad. It was California booze and drugs. No wonder. You know, I just had to blame something. If only, if only, if only, and yet there was a part of me that knew there are no if onlys here. This is the way it is. And I, I felt like I'd learned my lesson. I just had kind of a surrender, and I learned my lesson. I stepped my meetings up from one a month to one a week. Sounded like a lot of meetings to me. And uh, I got a letter on the 6th of February, which was a Friday. I got a letter in the mail that had one joint in it. I decided to keep it because I thought, you know, you just never know when you might need something like this. <laughs> you know, it was so amazing I needed it the next day, you know. Just... <laughs> the timing on that thing. Yeah, right, right. That was a great reminder for me, and as it would come to be, is that I, I'm not somebody who can have booze or drugs in my home. I need to put that protection plan in place. There have been many times in the last 30 years where if I had all the wrong things going on and booze was available... I might have a different sobriety date because, you see, I'm not immune and I'm not cured. I am, I am an active disease. 
And sometimes it's a little bit tougher to deal with than other times. But the daily maintenance of my spiritual condition is what has kept me sober a day at a time for over 30 years. It's, it's not something I can casually visit. It is the maintenance, and for me, that is a daily maintenance, that daily reprieve that we all get. And so I uh, smoked that one joint on the 7th of February, and it did for me what nothing been able to do. It brought me to my internal knees. It, it flatlined me spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. Physically, I'm now 18 years old, and you're bouncing back pretty quick. But I had been so ed- empty and dead inside for quite some time. And now, now it just bottomed out. And what happened to me is instead of all the objections that I would always come up with before, from somewhere, I didn't pray, I didn't ask for help, I didn't call out to God, but he took that window and he sent in the thought, and that was those AA people seemed to know what to do. And on February the 8th, 1976, I went back to that meeting I'd been going to once a week, and I asked the old-timers the most important question of my life. What do you do to stay sober? End of question. No debate, no, yeah, but my case is different, oh, that's for you. I don't know what you do, but my life stinks because I'm running it. And I don't want to live this way. Anymore. I don't want to keep breathing if this is the path because it's not, this is not happy, joyous, and free. They knew I meant business. And they said to me, well, what we do is one day at a time, we don't take the first drink or anything else that affects us from the neck up and we have a sobriety date. We go to a lot of meetings and we get a home group. We get somebody that we can talk to and that's a sponsor. We take these steps and we get to develop a relationship with the God of our own understanding. You know those steps, Deb? Those aren't just for the group. Those are for you to also learn how to apply in your personal life. And we try to be of service and to carry this message. That was the bar they set for me. It is something to shoot for, to do my best in every day. I'm human. I'm flawed. I've got faults. You bet. But it has always been on the path of Alcoholics Anonymous that I have done my best to stay. So I jumped in here full feet, full body, and and I was just on fire. You've got that newcomer energy going on. You've got that youth going on. Now, again, I don't want to give the impression that I I did everything perfect. There was that part of my life which was young, experimental in relationships and all that kind of stuff. But when it came to AA, I was really dead on. I was right where you were. I hung with the old timers like their shadow. I got a sponsor. I began to study the book. It used to be something that would put me to sleep because I just... I had one time, you know, been an honor roll student, and now I can't even grasp what I'm reading here. I know this book's really important, but for some reason nothing is sticking. And so she began to help me instead of read it to study it, and then just one more time came alive. I still attend a book study, and I love it when they seem to put those paragraphs in that overnight they weren't there last time I read it. (laughs) And uh, our book is so alive. It is so alive. And um, shy of my fourth birthday, a couple weeks, moved to Atlanta for a job. And I I would get that sponsor locked in, that home group locked in, took a four-year cake. And there was this click in my mind that said, you know, you're four years sober. Now you know something. Yeah. Oh, okay. You know, the problem is, is I don't know where that came from, but I listened to it. I didn't check this by a sponsor who was sober over 30 years at the time. Mm -mm. I'm four years sober. I know something. And what would happen is that I would walk into the room marked complacency and not know it because it doesn't have a sign on it. But the actions I would take fit. And over a two-year period of time, incrementally, things changed. Not right away. But six years of sobriety, I'm taking a cake and feeling very restless, irritable, and discontent. I don't like, I'm bored here. I'm not giving either. I'm sitting in meetings, take, 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 take. 
I failed to look at the things I had changed, which was instead of getting to my home group 45 to 60 minutes, I'm getting there five. Instead of being one of the last people to leave my home group, I'm going, amen, shake, shake, and you're looking at taillights. <laughs> my commitment is something during the meeting so I don't have to put effort before or after. I'm not working with anyone new because I'm busy. And I'll tell you, I began to slowly, one more time, go into a negative isolation. Six years of sobriety, this was what was going on, but I didn't look at that to be the problem. I, I said men, money, and mansions are going to make me happy. People, places, and things, men, money, and mansions. And so I got to, about the business of looking for that, and three weeks later on a Friday, I met a little fellow. He had all the qualifications I was looking for. Even if it's over three years, but hadn't been to, uh, 13 years, hadn't been to a meeting in three, but no problem. Uh, I'm going to help you. And, uh, <laughs> and um, he, of course, he didn't ask for any of my help or anything, but I was going to willingly help this fella. And th what happened is the light switch of insanity got flipped on inside of me. After three months of this whirlwind romance, of which I was the only one involved, uh, <laughs> I hate those kind. Um, <laughs> this little fella, he got married to somebody else. So I let him go and... Um, <laughs> Yeah, it just, just doesn't take long to find another little fellow very similar in qualification, do this dance of death for three months, watch him go down the aisle with somebody else, and finally at 6.9 years of sobriety, I bottomed out one more time. Just like I had on February 7th, one more time I bottomed out emotionally, spiritually, mentally, physically looking fine, bottomed out where it counts. And I recommitted myself to Alcoholics Anonymous because there's only two options. You drink again for relief or you recommit yourself to AA for relief. And this is the way it, for me, it's 110%. Now I realize there is no 110% technically, but what that means to me is doing everything I know to do and then some. It's going that extra bit that will always be the cushion for me. I uh, would get, a um, few years later, I would get married in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd moved to Southern California. Um, I got really active. My life just got lit. Um, I was active where I was, but this was just a whole new genre almost. Um, and I really got lit up. Uh, five years and nine months into that marriage, it would come to an end. And uh, my, you know, my ego's involved, my pride. I felt like such a loser. And, you know, I'll never have another date again. And um, I just felt like such a chump and such a goof. And, you know, all of those kinds of things. And, uh, you know, it was, it was just going to be part of the journey for me. And sometimes God does for me what I will not do for myself. Not only what I can't, but what I won't do for myself. And what I had to do is, you know, I look at that marriage and have to look at my own part in it and realize that I know nothing about being a partner. I didn't know that. Selfish, self-serving, self-centered behavior will not make for a good collaboration. And that's what I was doing. And so I had to take my own inventory and make my own amends and, and begin to learn how to do things differently. And, uh, and I did, and I began to uh, do things differently in my life, and I was committed totally to Alcoholics Anonymous, and at, um, in April of 2000 at a convention, I would meet the man who would become my husband. Uh, he's a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, too. And a year later, in fact, next Friday, we celebrate our fifth anniversary, so we got married in April of 2001. We went to Atlanta, and this was a year for our first anniversary. This was a, um, uh, the last of all the people, places, and things Kent needed to see and meet that were important in my life, places I've lived and been, people that were key to me. And uh, so here we are. We're back, back in Atlanta. On April, 
I, I go to my home group meeting that Friday night. It met Tuesday, Friday. Went to a home group meeting that night. Just charged up. Great seeing the folks that are still going there. Sun, Saturday morning, say my prayers, get my day started. Go to this uh, luncheon with some non-alcoholic friends. And we sit down for lunch, and there is lovely table laid out and a pre-poured goblet of wine. And so I'm pretty sure I know what this is, and so I inquired, yes, it's blah, blah, wine, and I said, oh, and I pushed it out of my reach. And I, I don't get psychological about what happened, but what happened to me as a result of that luncheon is it activated a six-month physical craving to be drunk. I'm 26 plus years sober. I am so in the middle of you. I'm not somebody who goes to one meeting a year, lets you know I'm still sober. I am in the middle of this deal. How could this possibly happen? And that day where we're, I was just so glad when we left, I loved the people, but that I, I was uncomfortable with what was starting to happen. And I figured, like a lot of things, it just kind of has this meteorite effect, and it goes through, and it blazes out. But it wasn't. And, and I was getting more annoyed about this, and immediately I'm asking myself, if you have this, what are you doing wrong? Because my belief had been, if I am doing everything right, doing the 110%, keeping everything current, strong relationship with God, strong foothold with sponsor, program, sponsees, etc., then the, the physical craving or the mental obsession will, will not be able to creep in. So I obviously have a leak, wink, leak, link week, you know what I mean, <laughs> somewhere, but how did that get in there, how did that, how'd that slip in, and I am like micro-inventorying my life, I start looking at the things that I know in history have taken people out, are you, are you skipping on meetings, no, are you flaking on commitments, no, lying, stealing, cheating, doing any inappropriate behavior, secrets, no, are you working with others? God is more than I've ever worked with at one time. Are you active with your sponsor? Oh, yes. I mean, that, I mean, it just bumped it up even more because I am regular with her. How's your relationship with God? Believe you me, if it was not as tightly tethered, I would have a different sobriety. There were moments where the, the pull to drink was so powerful. I never experienced that in sobriety, that I was afraid I would drink against my will. That's how magnetically strong it was. I can't explain it any more clear, but I, I was, I couldn't figure out what am I doing wrong. I would constantly ask my sponsor, do you see anything? My husband who lives with me, don't justify anything. Do you see something I am or am not doing? I'm not looking for pats on the back. Let me know. I would beg, plead, cry to God. Please take this away, whatever you need me to do. And I, it just would be circle, heavy light, heavy light, but it just never left. And finally, it was a morning in October, and I'm at a meeting that morning. The meeting's over. I'm driving home, and I am struck with the terror that I will drink against my will. And I get on the phone to my sponsor, and... She had been with her own personal things with health and her husband and things like that the last couple of weeks, but God knew I needed her more than anybody on the planet right at that moment, and she was there. I explained to her what was going on. I was crying. Luckily, I was just a few minutes from home, and she said something I've heard a lot but would make the change. She said, Honey, what we have is alcoholism, not alcohol wasn't. And what happened to me is an exhale. I'm not doing anything wrong. I have an active current disease that is big time reminding me of so many things. Not that I ever took them for granted, 
but it is just like a fresh coat of paint on everything I know. You do not take your physical sobriety for granted. You don't take um, a relationship with God for granted without maintenance. You, you don't take this program for granted without participation. That it is one day at a time that I get this reprieve. I've gotten to put a lot of days together. But why it would happen, I don't know. And instead of, what am I doing wrong? I flip that over to, thank God I was doing everything I was doing. What if any of those things had been amiss? What if any of those things had been, I quit doing it three years ago? I don't know. If anything, I need you to stay in the center of you more than ever. I need to be right in the middle of you. You know, I'm so reminded of those four points that Dr. Bob talks about in his story, and just to paraphrase what he says, touches my heart. He talks about that doing what he does and helping others, and like the things that have recently been brought into my life, you know, it's my reminder for me, what he says, that it is a pleasure. And it is a pleasure to be here and share my story with you. That it's a sense of duty. You had a speaker last week, you'll have another one next week. It just happens to be my turn tonight for this group. It is a duty. That it takes a little insurance out against a slip. Because I'm reminded when I tell you my story, where I have come from and where I don't want to go and how I love where I am today. And that it passes on to the man, it pays back to the man who passed it on to him. And I want to say thank you for being here tonight and carrying the message to me. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.